Welcome to today's webinar, Copywriting Hacks. It's August 25th, 2021. This is DNA. We're a top equity crowdfunding agency, investor and user acquisition. Advertising is a huge part of what we do because traffic from those sources, from paid channels, is scalable. We're able to find a cost per acquisition, a return on ad spend that makes sense and really ramp it up. But that's not possible without strong messaging. We're going to talk about advertising messaging, other applications of this copy, uh, of this copy that uh, you'll be able to apply yourself just by participating today. Uh, very excited to have Sarah Bradbury, our uh, head creative uh, copywriter, uh, on the call today. Going to pull up a slide with their photo. But Sarah, we have you on video. How, yes. how are you doing today? I'm doing super well. I had my coffee, so I'm I'm good to go with my my caffeine levels. But yes, as you mentioned, my name is Sarah. I am a copywriter at DNA and I love it so much. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, and it also started from a super long time ago. So I started doing copywriting for influencer marketing uh, way back in the day and then started moving into real estate marketing. And then from real estate marketing, I joined DNA and got to work with a ton of different brands as the copywriter and content marketer. And then now I am here today with Jason. <laughs> there we go, quite a path, very uh, exciting there. I'm gonna pull up uh, our deck and start presenting. Uh, awesome. Anyone who's listening on can request this and we will be able to share uh, after today's discussion. I'm uh, gonna go back and forth on some longer video uh, answers. So don't feel like anything's malfunctioning if you see us full screen and then back. Uh, as mentioned, Sarah, Sarah's a copywriter, actually producing the copy for ads that produce millions of dollars in capital per month. So this isn't a one -on 101 course. Uh, we're not college professors talking about theory although that is quite an accomplishment uh, and accolade at that, but that's not us. We're showing you exactly what we do on these live campaigns, running 30 to 50 of them at any given time. Should just show you the live ads and uh, some of the stats that are, are coming up there. But uh, what is ad copywriting? Why is it important to pay attention to the words you use in your ads? Sarah, what, what's your take on that? What's, you know, how can you tell if that the words you're putting in are, are good or if something's underperforming? So the words in ads are very, very important. You always want to make sure that you're driving urgency. So that can be as simple as using the word now or uh, this opportunity won't last or do this today and just really uh, spark like a CTA or a call to action with your ad copy so that you are directing your investor uh, or your potential investor to do something essentially. So that is what I would say is the uh, the most important thing as far as paying attention to the words in your ads. You want to make sure you're being super clear. Couldn't agree more. Words matter. Uh, actually, I'll take from uh, Ryan Folan, four-time TEDx speaker, a uh, good friend of mine, had the privilege of uh, being a, a member of his boat on various tours. And I, I've heard you know preaching about messaging and the importance of words. He has a system called the 313 method. You break what you do down into three sentences, then down in one sentence, and then in three words, and it's more powerful. The audience retains it at a higher level. They're able to uh, regurgitate it to people around them to a greater degree. That's what the goal is for copy in my perspective. Uh, on this page, you can see you wanna make your ads more attractive. Uh, in this case, the target investors, but to any target audience you're going after make your ads more clickable and engaging. Those are metrics we're gonna be measuring. So design the ads for that specific purpose and ultimately drive investment by convincing your target investor that your offering will make a social impact. It will improve their portfolio. It's going to be something that pans out to be very positive further down the road. Sarah, you're talking about action. You're talking about uh, you know, inspiring that type of response. What else defines good copy? So what else defines good copy is definitely, as you said, language being used, verbiage being used, but also the themes that are used. So the themes that are used are also extremely important. Um, you know, for example, if there is a raise milestone to share, 
uh, like a press release on a national publication or the raise has hit a specific milestone, uh, that's always important to report on as far as copy goes, just so that if you are receiving the ad in your feed for some reason, you haven't engaged with it yet, and you receive another one, you get to kind of follow along with the campaign or what's going on with the campaign from an advertising perspective. So you don't necessarily need to be following all these channels, but if you are in the sphere of influence, then you will get the message. The sphere of influence. That That's is a real estate term. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. It's and a you good know, one. if anyone's listening and saying, how do I become the sphere of influence? This sounds difficult. This is tough. It's not what I do. It's easier than it sounds. And working with our content marketing department, our creative studio, we've been able to put together some of these essential hacks. Uh, writing with your investor in mind, always have the target audience uh, in the background. What are they going to physically respond to? I like using an offline, online analogy of if you ran into your target audience in the hallway, what, what would you say to them? If you had that elevator pitch moment, or even if they're sitting down for an investor luncheon of sorts, what would you communicate? How do we get that to live online? Uh, number two, make it short, snappy, and eye-catching. Less is more. <laughs> I talked about the three words. I, I can remember three words. You know, just do it, Nike. I'm always going to remember that. If it were 18 words, I would miss a word here or there. I then would feel unconfident, uh, you know, trying to repeat it. You want your audience to feel like the expert here. Make it catchy. Make it, uh, you know, very short for them to uh, be able to uh, repeat. Have a clear and direct call to action. Uh, Sarah was mentioning real estate. I remember uh, a stat saying uh, failing real estate agents don't ask for the business. Have a very direct call to action. Ask for it. Uh, Sarah, you want to go through four through seven? Yeah, absolutely. So four, you definitely want to focus on the benefits and not the features. So why would this investor or your sphere of influence uh, want to invest their dollar into your company? Uh, number five, lean on the numbers and third-party validation. So that goes back to sharing milestones, sharing uh, press releases that have been featured or anything really uh, key that you need to share with your audience. So make it emotional, it's number six. So that's really one of the most important things I think as far as creating the copy, make it emotional. And then that also goes with making it urgent. So by adding those two together, you can get a really solid piece of copy uh, before it gets sent out there. Absolutely. And make it emotional. Be intentional about what emotion you're creating in the audience. Associate it with a positive emotion. Uh, I was just in a branding exercise this week, and I gave the, the Los Angeles Dodgers logo and brand as an example, and was defining the emotions I get, uh, both good and bad over the years, but that, but, you know, it takes me back to a place in childhood, that, that emotion is present when I see the colors and the logo, think about what emotion you're creating with your audience with this copy. And, you know, moving on to the audience. So, you know, write with your investors in mind, going back to these tips. This will make it possible to write highly targeted, very relevant copy that resonates with them. We like to create a fictional character. In this case, Jill Scott. It's funny, I actually know a Jill Scott, but uh, you, you want to have this persona, this image that uh, symbolizes the audience that you're going after. If we come up with advertising copy for a given channel, we can ask ourselves, would, would Jill Scott take the time to care if they receive this promotion? Would the messaging uh, be of value to them or something that is an annoyance, something that brushes off? It allows us to really personify who we're going after. So, you know, we, we put it in a bio, an age, work, family, location, archetype, everything. We want to define them. She's organized, practical, protective, hardworking. The personality will even put together graphs such as this, the preferred channels, because if we're studying Jill Scott, we're going to be able to tell where does she go online? Where does she get influences? What is she reading before bed uh, or in the morning or on her lunch break on her mobile device or, or any device for that matter? Uh, what are her goals, frustrations, motivations? Uh, Sarah, do you want to talk more about this and, and maybe even Jill Scott? and uh, how you then use this information to create uh, high impact ad copy? 
Right. So, okay. Uh, so with the investor in mind, I personally do not know a Jill Scott, but with the investor in mind, uh, you really want to try to understand uh, what their interests are. Um, does this differ per channel? That's something also to keep in mind. So is Jill Scott the same on Facebook and LinkedIn as Jill Scott is on Instagram? Or will Jill Scott need to see something different on Instagram? Um, so for example, like if you're your company is in like the pet industry and you're targeting Jill Scott and Jill Scott does not have a pet, then Jill Scott is probably not going to be your target investor in mind. So you definitely wanna keep that in mind uh, when you're writing. So my process as far as writing to the investors, I really try to put myself in their shoes and I personally am a pet owner. So for those clients, <laughs> it's a little bit easier for me to write the copy, but that that is what I do. I really, really try to understand who they are, really put myself in their position and uh, try to be empathetic because uh, with that, I can, you know, really figure out where I would personally spend my money, how I would personally spend my money, and then uh, forming a nice sentence around that. Absolutely. And we like to really break it down to an individual situation where Jill sees an advertisement, sees a, a piece of marketing. And if she's traveling four to eight times per month for work, she's probably seeing it in an airport, hotel, uh, Uber, what have you during the travel. Um, she, she has frustration around booking for her trips, wants to narrow down options. Um, this could be for a travel product. Uh, it could be for any number of products, but being able to, uh, that the investment opportunity would surround, but being able to picture where they're engaging with the content. You know, maybe, maybe it's a travel site, maybe it's on Instagram, as you were mentioning there, Sarah. But having all of that in mind, I think at times as marketers, we can just look at traveler as an audience on a whiteboard or digital whiteboard these days without really understanding what the dynamic is when the, the copy is actually reaching the user. Okay, so make it short, skimmable, eye-catching, use simple, basic sentence structures that are easy for your readers to follow. If somebody's scrolling through their device at the bank, they have 45 seconds, you reach them at second five and uh, they, they see an Instagram ad, or let's call it a Facebook ad, right in between their family's posts. Uh, coworkers, people they met at a party 10 years ago, this ad comes up. Are they going to sit there and read a paragraph? Unlikely. Uh, are, are they going to be engaged with three words? Potentially. You want to find the right sentence structure, but with the format in mind. Look at an actual example of the ad, a test of the ad. See how it flows in your feed. Ask yourself if it's something that you would engage with. And then with, uh, with Jill Scott, with your target audience, are they going to scroll right past this? Are they going to read one line and say, I, I can't deal with this right now. I have to go get my rental car. Or, you know, are they going to click further and be engaged to further that experience? Sarah, anything to add there? Any, any exercises that you do to make it short, skimmable, and eye-catching? Any yeah. tips that uh, we, could, we could share? Yeah, absolutely. So when you are making ad copy, short, skimmable, and eye-catching, you very quickly want to be able to identify who the company is. You very quickly want to identify what their value add is. And then you very quickly want to add why they should be investing their dollars. So it's one, two, three, and that's usually what I keep going with. So I do what, I do um, why, and I do uh, who the company is. Um, if there's a retargeting ad and you're trying to keep it simple and short as well, you want to make sure that you're alleviating confusion if there is any with uh, this ad. Uh, you want to add the problem, the solution that your company is solving, and then how your company can add value to this investor. So it's always three very specific things that I use. People can remember three. That is a, mm -hmm. a good approach there. And if you're interested in what these ad copies look like from a example perspective, um, here are two campaigns uh, that have done particularly well uh, in the past few months. Uh, Oslo Power on micro ventures uh, with multiple rounds there. Uh, Cybolt, uh, one of the fastest growing campaigns, a matter of a few weeks, hit, hitting seven figure levels and, and beyond. 
Um, so uh, very excited to see, I think we did 900K the first few days, the first week. Mm -hmm. So a very strong community there. Uh, making it short skim by catching, this makes your ad skimmable and it prevents the content from looking too overwhelming. Uh, you can use emojis to help draw investors' eyes to the ad copy. This is commonly done in the text. The text is that set of words above the image, in this case, above the video. Uh, commonly with equity crowdfunding ads, and you could look at uh, start engine ads. You could look at some, some pages that have equity crowdfunding themes around them. They'll often have an introductory sentence and then three bullet points, three emojis, um, this, these are sets of creative that did uh, well in comparison to other ad formats we were running. Uh, we're going to get into this more, but I would A-B test everything. I would have multiple sets of creative and optimize towards what's working best, letting the analytics tell you what's working best, not assumption. We always have assumption going in, but the, the numbers have to show us that it's working. So this is what we optimize towards. Uh, then I want to point out this text underneath that's bold. Facebook calls that the headline. Uh, and it'll be, you know, similar formats for Facebook and Instagram. Instagram is more image heavy, uh, but you'll see the prioritization, the hierarchy of this messaging uh, in the comments below and the format of the words below. So um, Sarah, you want to talk about what you did here for Cybolt and also Power? Yes. So for Cybolt, what we're doing in this copy is highlighting uh, the market growth or market statistics uh, for cybersecurity. So we're, we're clearly showing that it's going to, or that it is projected to grow. And now is your chance to get in on the investment opportunity before it grows so that you can receive uh, whatever back from that you would get from that investment. So we're highlighting uh, one of the themes that we use. There's a few different themes that we use as far as writing um, ad copy market growth, market size, market potential, absolutely one of them. So that's what we did with uh, Cybolt. And then in Oslo, we're discussing, um, you know, the renewable energy market is also projected to reach X amount by 2025. So we're showing that there is growth that will happen regardless. So why would you not want to invest in something that you know is going to be successful? So that's what we did with these. Very nice. And Sarah, why put these numbers in there? Why have market growth, you know, overall potential? You know, I see global energy consumption as trigger words that could pull someone in, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who, who's been, you know, reading, maybe watched a documentary on energy, global energy, mm -hmm. uh, potential issues, concerns over the years to come. Uh, I mean, that that's compelling. But why add these numbers and dates, and what are you putting those in there for? So words can be as compelling as they can, but you really do need to see the data and numbers in order to make a solid decision, as at least I do, I know you do. Um, so that's why, you know, there's definitely room for data to be shared. And a lot of people aren't going to be going and doing this research themselves. So if it's just presented right in front of them in that moment, uh, then it's great. Absolutely. If I say, hey, the global the global cybersecurity industry is really growing. You should invest in it. It's not as impactful if I say, hey, it's valued at $162.5 billion today. Uh, mm -hmm. In 2028, we're talking $418 billion. That's modestly conservative mm -hmm. at that. Right. Why not benefit from participating early stage in an investment in this vertical? That That's what the Cybolt audience is, you know, buying into. That's what they're a part of. And it's those numbers that really allow you to measure and, and make it real and even compare to other verticals to understand the game and what's at stake. Right. Excellent. So have a clear and direct call to action was another point of ours. Uh, a call to action makes it clear to potential investors which action to take next. If I just see an image and some copy, okay, great. I'm scrolling through uh, you know, I'm at a, a pool party, uh, common for one of our team members. It was a, an ongoing joke with one of our strategists. So it, it gets brought up in our strategies quite a bit. Uh, but if I, I, if I'm looking at something where my attention's kind of somewhere else and just briefly going through and I see a piece of content, I see a piece of copy, where do I go from there? I need to be told, learn more, click here, invest now, sign up. And then it feels like original thought. Oh, I should sign up. It, it's we're controlling the narrative 
with this copy and we can add a call to action that's rather strong, whether it's on the ad, whether it's on the landing page, any type of follow-up content, anything that's gonna be posted by a third party and they're discussing with us what to add, we can kind of have them point their audience on where to go. It's designed to remove friction and moving them down that investment funnel. Uh, we've shown images of the funnel before, but taking audiences from awareness to consideration, eventually to intent, and then conversion. But below that's multiple conversion. We're seeing 10 to 30% of investors participate a second time on these campaigns. So there's opportunity for that. Uh, but ultimately to advocacy, the ultimate form of marketing is peer-to-peer -peer marketing. So if you're taking them further and further down this funnel, that call to action on lower funnel marketing pieces uh, could be something along the lines of share. And that, that can be your most powerful resource at a, at a later point. Uh, Sarah, any calls to action that uh, you recommend? Anything you've uh, been seeing work uh, instrumentally well over the past few yes. weeks? Yeah. So actually, recently we're, we've been doing some urgency um, ads, like timed ads. Uh, so you know, within seven days, within three days, if there's a raise that's closing, uh, we want to make sure that we're really, really hitting them as many times as we can. Like this is your last chance. Like hurry, this won't last long. Like this is the opportunity. Like now's your chance to get in on, you know, the next big thing in this industry. So really, really trying to direct the investor or the audience um, to engage with the ad. So if they engage with the ad, um, that's most likely going to get them to engage further, which is great. So if they, you know, watch a video, if it says watch more or learn more, you can always direct to the raise page. You can watch something on the raise page. You can learn more on the raise page um, and you can invest on the raise page. So pretty much always just direct to your raise page. You can say, learn more, watch more, invest now, um, hurry, just all that great stuff. Um, so just really, really using those, those words. Absolutely, absolutely. Now we have been seeing um, some campaigns point to a landing page. We'll get into that a little bit, uh, but you can be promoting content and then having the content point directly to the raise page. Uh, I wanna give some more examples here. I have a clear and direct call to action. An effective call to action must urge investor to act immediately. Even if they don't, a lot of times it's seven touch points or more. Uh, so you, know, you wanna have an understanding of how Jill Scott is responding to each one. Be simple to follow, demand action, uh, effective calls to action for investors. As Sarah was sharing, learn more, invest now. Uh, here's some more examples, more numbers, uh, more trigger words to uh, define an industry. Um, Sarah, any, anything else that you wanna share uh, in terms of uh, clear and direct call to action? Uh, maybe revisions. So after you set up some ads, you get some initial analytics from Irene, mm -hmm. our, our head media buyer, you know, what do you do to then refine the call to action? So if the call to action is not working, if there is an ad for any reason that's not being engaged with, I will go ahead and I'll take a look at the copy and I'll say, okay, so what does the CTA say? Is there a better CTA for what this uh, theme of an ad is? And if there is, then I will just go ahead and adjust it and then we'll, we'll A-B test it. So test optimize scale, right? <laughs> so that's what we'll do with the ads. And then uh, hopefully we'll see something better. Hopefully we uh, won't have any issues, but if it is the copy, then we will sometimes lean on the creative aspect of it to really, really spark that remaining emotion. Absolutely. And uh, that's a big part of this. You know, as I mentioned, variance and letting the analytics tell you what's working best, you then need to optimize towards what's working best create new iterations, always be looking for even a slight increase in click-through rate and conversion rate. It can mean the world of difference to your results. So wanted to get into that step of the process. Uh, have some more examples to, uh, to share here as well. So, uh, you know, focus on the benefits, uh, you know, for the investors. Highlight how the investment will either directly benefit the investor or make a social impact. And here's a, a couple examples. Uh, this first one's for, for Rad Intelligence, an influencer network turned tech stack, amazing marketing tools. They did a campaign on WeFunder 
Uh, this is a lead investor in their app. Uh, actually, Chris Gravy uh, was on our, our podcast uh, this past week. Podcast is Test Optimize Scale. And it, it really goes a long way to have an anchor investor talking about what stood out to them in the deal, why it mattered, where they envisioned the growth to be. All compliant, of course, but third-party validation goes that much further. If I tell you an equity crowdfunding portal is great, that's fine. Uh, you know, we may work with them if the portal tells you that they uh, they're great. Again, it's 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 okay, but it's more impressive if you're reading from publishers, from influencers, from investors, from you know more and more sources saying how this portal is standing out among other portals and why they're one that you should really have your eye on and be acting on different opportunities there. So, uh, you know, wanted to be able to show percentage growth here, uh, highlight key uh, keywords such as influencer, marketing, platform, performance, things that stand out to industry professionals as this was a B2B product. Uh, got a high volume of strategic investors at that from the B2B community. It's an example I, I share when someone says, hey, business to business doesn't work on an equity crowdfunding portal. It's only uh, auto follow drones. Like, nope, nope, not the case. Here, here's an example. Uh, another one is, a, is actually a portal we're working with, and this is for their fundraise, uh, Waterworks. Uh, Sarah, you want to talk about Waterworks a little bit or, you know, focusing on the benefits, uh, the impact? Right. So Waterworks is a really, really interesting um, portal. They are actually trying to find sustainable solutions for water resources across the world so that there is access to clean water um, for everyone. So they are really, really an interesting, um, they have an interesting goal. So it's something that everyone can get behind. And it's really about using the language um, that you can to tell the story and the problem that they're solving. Uh, so I, I, I really, really enjoy working um, on Waterworks ads. I really do. They have a lot of very, very cool things. Absolutely. And uh, building a whole community of issuers focused on similar social impact goals. Uh, niche equity crowdfunding portals are on the rise. Uh, there are portals for celebrity focused raises, uh, vegan focused raises, um, healthcare focused raises. There's going to be more and more uh, of these organizations uh, as the audience is already mapped out and they're able to bring uh, their followers to the deals who already fit the audience profiles. They're targeting, as we saw in the target audience example, Jill Scott's over and over again and being able to see a high conversion rate uh, versus a, a portal with a whole spectrum of different verticals. Uh, that's not to say any one is better, but that is their unique selling proposition. So it, it's been interesting to watch uh, and how it speaks to copy. Again, they already know uh, what copy is going to resonate, uh, what interest uh, the audience has so they can figure out the next uh, issuers to bring to the table. Uh, we mentioned a bit about social proof, third-party validation. Arguably, the strongest factor to digital marketing in many people's uh, responses. If, uh, if someone's showing up at the top of Google, what type of validation does that show? Uh, if uh, a major lead investor is talking about a deal, if a portal, if Forbes, Entrepreneur, Inc. is talking about a deal, it, it just appears to be stronger than that same company with copy, with an advertisement, not demonstrating uh, the validation that they get from third parties, not, not showcasing that, that social proof. It earns credibility, particularly from a cold audience who does not know of you, top of the funnel audience, as we would say in-house, uh, they're at the awareness stage. You can influence potential investors uh, to take action mid funnel and lower funnel by showing more groups that have talked about you as a founder, as a marketer uh, for an issuer. Uh, for, furthermore, uh, you should be able to constantly have updates and uh, provide glimpses into the momentum that your organization, organization has. We'll send out weekly emails. Uh, we'll do multiple posts per week on social media, uh, weekly or bi-weekly blog and vlog, monthly webinar as part of our content marketing efforts for clients. 
And the whole idea is if every time you speak to your investor audience, you're able to share a new third-party validator. Hey, check out this keynote I just did at this panel yesterday, this digital conference, great attendance. Look at what we did with this accelerator. They're, they're thinking about coming back on board at this level. Check out what uh, the Wall Street Journal said about us. Look at this video an investor just shared. You want to have that ongoing story and be able to control the narrative. So again, that investor uh, can repeat it as they're trying to justify that with their first degree connections or even share and recommend the opportunity to their uh, circles, to their cohorts. Sarah, anything to add for social proof or any, any ideas, any exercises that listeners uh, can apply for their own uh, ad copy creation? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So it's extremely important to include the third party validation as well as social proof, uh, because a lot of these investors will be socially driven. Um, so showcasing, you know, the momentum and the traction in the present moment is uh, it helps along the journey. So as an investor, you follow the journey, you follow the story. And when you get to be updated with all of these um, exciting uh, updates, I guess I should say, but uh, it's, it's great. So you get to um, really follow the journey and that's something that investors want to do. Absolutely. There's a saying, I think it's in the, the book Sapiens of the more times an individual hears the same piece of information from the more sources and trusted sources at that, the more they believe it. So if you have publishers, investors, accelerators, industry partners, uh, financial thought leaders, so on and so forth, talking about how great this deal is, how revolutionary the technology is, the more likely they are going to be believing that. Uh, that means that the, their participation is gonna occur at a higher and higher rate. Uh, looking at this quote, Brands use numbers of testimonials from lead investors, influencers, partners as proof of their offerings effectiveness. Investors are more likely to trust other investors. It's why many people turn to social networks and accredited publications for investment recommendations. We see it happen with uh, cryptocurrency and the digital assets and the FOMO, the fear of missing out as more posts, more stories uh, incorporate uh, increases uh, in value to positions that uh, tokens uh, you know, are having for its users. Same things happening for equity crowdfunding, same things avail available to you for your investor acquisition initiatives. I uh, want to expand upon that. Um, Sarah, you wanna talk about uh, creating copy and uh, yeah. some of the, the different testimonials that could be included? Yeah, absolutely. So customer testimonials, uh, investor or advisor testimonials are very important. These can um, often be included with a video uh, of this investor or um, customer giving the testimonial. So these are important because it highlights uh, success stories that you've had, um, you know, and personalize your uh, your um, investing experience, I suppose, and showcase the impact that you currently have. Um, with investor and advisors, um, highlighting the positive things that investors are saying about why they invested um, is very important. So if there's any big, tes uh, big testimonials from big investors, then that would be the move as well. So if they can do a video testimonial and say what they, or why they invested, um, that will often help along those who are on the edge of investing. Absolutely. And these are more successful campaigns. Uh, Vironment did uh, over a million on uh, WeFunder and before expansion. Caddy uh, went well over that amount after expansion. And you could see on Caddy's ad, uh, we have the use of the emoji. Uh, but beyond that, Start Engine being on there shows social proof. Forbes, okay, wow, this is a standout. Yeah. Uh, you know, in a target audience's eyes. How, why is Forbes speaking about them? This is very, very interesting. An Amazon approach. I know how successful Amazon is mm -hmm. as 
I'm Jill Scott in this scenario. Uh, they're on a golf course. That means they have partnerships there. This is validated within the golf community. Uh, th this is for an automated retail campaign that just continues growing, continues taking on strategic partners, and it speaks loudly. And it showed up in their conversion rate for the campaign. Uh, beyond social proof and third-party validation, you do want to mix it. Uh, you, you do want to show founders. Uh, the founders of Caddy uh, were featured right and left. We actually used them uh, in videos for the advertisements. Very, very powerful team over there. I, I think it's a, a large attributor, if not the, 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 the top uh, for their campaign was uh, the connection with the founders and the investors. Uh, projections of where those founders will be with the organization in years to come. Was very impressed. Uh, Paul from Vironment uh, is in the same category there. Uh, when we look at Oslo Power, when we look at Grit Boxing, when we look at all of these examples, the founder plays a large role in this. So it's not to, to discount anything uh, about first party. It should be a combination of both. We see the most active founders often raising the highest amounts. So, uh, you know, it, they're the ones who are winning the attention from Forbes. They're the ones who are winning, uh, you know, the, the endorsements from their investors, such as Terry Bailey here. I uh, want to be able to point that out, that you have a role in getting these third-party validations. They will resonate best with you. Sarah, make it emotional. What does that mean? Yes. So... Emotion is very important. You really want to spark the emotion when you're writing. So if you just write something bland and not exciting, you probably won't see a whole lot of engagement with it. Uh, if you want to spark emotion within your um, sphere of influence or your audience, it's very important to include specific keywords if you're trying to drive social change or impact. Um, you really want to convey that through the words that you use. So words very important less is more very important urgency and emotion very important so they all go hand in hand but uh you can like specify different words that you use in ads to make it more emotional or less emotional um just depending on what your company does sure absolutely and i think about in my everyday conversations and if i use an emotional word when i'm describing a, a restaurant uh, a concert, a hotel uh, that I went to, maybe may a painful situation going through uh, security uh, at an airport or going through uh, customs or something like that. It really brings the story to life, becomes more memorable. If I want to inspire action or have a call to action, it's going to be a, a higher conversion rate of that. Same's true with investor discussions. Again, that offline online scenario. If you feel like you can understand the founder and on an emotional level, if you have that type of drive towards the social impact goal and some emotions rooted there that maybe date years back and, and this company is a solution uh, to, to that, you're gonna see it uh, perform. You're gonna see higher analytics associated with it. Uh, emotions to focus on for investors, inspiration, curiosity, fear of missing out, innovation, uh, as we could see in the advertising uh, creative. You want them to have that fear of missing out and you want them to be compelled. So, you know, looking at the advertising messaging here, Sarah, what was the idea behind this set of copy? So really trying to convey uh, the potential for digital risk um, in the future, which is very possible. So uh, what Cybolt does is they manage security. Uh, so that's one of the most important things um, of this ad. You really want to try to convey to the uh, investor that, yes, this is happening in the future. You definitely want to get on board with it now. And we're doing what we have to do in order to make sure that there's a solution for that in the future. So yeah, just highlighting the, the value add. And when you're coming up with these ideas uh, for, for clients, mm -hmm. what is generally the response? Is it, yes, this is what's in our pitch deck or it reflects conversations with the investors. 
Uh, do they ever point out competitors and talk about what they're seeing there, what they think will work in the, the vertical as a result? Uh, is it warmly received to use, uh, you know, emotion and really tap into that mechanism when putting together advertising copy? What do those discussions look like? So the discussions typically centralize around urgency always. Uh, the data is always great. Um, we definitely have occasion occasional changes with um, advertising copy, but it's just, you know, uh, adding in some branding here and there if there was like lack of branding um, with the brand assets that I received. Um, you know, there's just different things that can be adjusted, but, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I pretty much will, will use the, the same. I just had a, a whole brain, brain thing. It just went, flew away, but <laughs> <laughs> what was the question again? <laughs> Basically what the advertising uh, conversations look like yeah. during okay. development stages, if there's resistance to any of these or. You no, know, so what, there's what never, the never resistance. Is never resistance. It's always uh, very specific with, you know, traction, growth charts, data, uh, market research, just anything under the hood that nobody would know about uh, prior to seeing the ad, investor testimonials, customer testimonials. If something doesn't work, it's very easy to switch a theme and, and change it up. Um, so just always testing mm -hmm. and seeing how it works and then scaling from there. Sure. I'd also recommend to make these discussions visual. So mm -hmm. whether that's an agency speaking to a client or a marketing director talking to the CEO or, you know, any, you know, cohort that's putting together these advertising creatives, if you're able to show it, it brings it to life. If we say, hey, we've put these ads into a Facebook feed as a demo, let's take a look. Uh, versus we wanted to use uh, emotional words in there. We want right. to put, you know, love, uh, climate change, uh, you know, very trigger driven words. We don't want to let the uh, projection of that uh, go to the, the viewer and their imagination. We want to show this, this is exactly what we're thinking. Here's five ads. Which three should we start with? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we want to have variants. It's often two to six. So Keep in mind how many you're ultimately going to need to present, but make it visual. If there's doubt, show competitors. Here's exactly what another in, uh, group in our industry is running on their equity crowdfunding campaign. You can actually look it up on, on Facebook in the advertising mm -hmm. library and see the actual ads they're running. Use that as inspiration. They're probably targeting the same audiences. What if that individual, what if Jill Scott sees your ad uh, and then they're at afterwards or vice versa. What is the overall impression going to be? How are you adding to the conversation? These should all be discussion points, but visually not abstract. Hey, this is the idea as much as this is exactly what we want to run. Exactly. And then if you do see an ad that you like, it can always be made better. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Me. Never ending process. <laughs> So going back to our presentation here, back to our, our deck, which again, is available to you, uh, instilling a sense of FOMO. I think it's an actual word in the dictionary at this point. I think so. FOMO. I think it is. <laughs> fear the fear of missing, of missing out. out. Fear is a strong motivator. You look at the hierarchy of needs, it is a driver. So having that sense of FOMO is key especially towards the end of the campaign. That's when many issuers see the highest volume of conversions, individuals who are maybe on the sidelines as your campaign's raising and then really come to bat the last few days, the last day. I hate to say the last few hours, but it happens. Uh, it's key to encourage those investors to engage in the campaign before time runs out. Make it as easy as possible for them to move forward. Exactly, exactly. And that's all with the, the words that you use. And uh, going back to like the timeline ads, if you do know that your raise is ending soon, do a 30 day ad, do a two week ad, do seven days, three days, last 48 hours, last 24 hours. I personally am a last hour kind of investor. So, <laughs> so that's why we need them. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, when you think of the funnel, 
there is a larger audience that doesn't convert. Google says an average conversion rate is 2.35%. We call it 2%. It's even lower uh, for investment initiatives, looking at the average order value and comparing it to average order values on Amazon or other platforms. So, uh, you know, hitting a 2% conversion rate is generally uh, very good. It's very scalable, very constructive at that. So, uh, e even in that scenario, 98% of your audience is not acting. If you're able to create that urgency, you're able to get them to have to participate before this ends, they can't miss out on it. If you go from a 2% conversion rate to a 3% conversion rate, and you have 50,000 visitors that have gone through your page, uh, that, that's the difference from 1,000 investors and, and 1,500 investors. Huge. If that is you know, an extra uh, $1,000 per investor, and now the campaign did 1.5 million instead of 1 million, that, that, that is going to be a very sizable uh, difference with uh, the proceeds and the use of those to follow. So uh, do whatever you can to increase that conversion rate, especially towards the end of the campaign. Make sure you're being compliant here. There are some rules about closing messaging. So check with your portal, uh, make sure uh, you know, legal's involved and advertising copy that's, that's being signed off. Uh, we try to submit that in given cycles. So it's very easy to get that approval. Uh, for, for issuers, but uh, make sure that the urgency is there. If I say, hey, invest in this company at any point, let me know whenever. Or if I say this round's closing, it's your last chance to get in at this cost. Here's where uh, the industry is going. We can't have forward looking statements, but at the same time, being able to paint a picture where that investor does not want to invest later. They don't want to come in at a higher price. This is the chance for them. This is the opportunity. Here are some examples of urgency phrases like limited time, time is running out, ending soon, act soon, don't wait, don't miss out. You don't want it to be an infomercial, but at the same time, you want to convey the fact that this is the time. If they're going to get involved, now is the time to do it. Here's some examples for Caddy. Here's some examples for, for Rad Intelligence. Sarah, anything to add to this? Yeah, so like you said, the urgency phrases are very important. So these can all be uh, interchanged throughout the um, course of the raise. So you can always say, don't wait, even if you've only been, uh, you've had your raise going for a few weeks. Like you can still say act soon, even though you've only had it going for a little while. Um, all of these urgency phrases can be used at any point. Um, and then with these ads, so uh, with Caddy, it says, you know, we've hit our $100,000 mark, which is great. I love including a milestone just because that also shows you like, hey, like there is momentum behind this raise. So you definitely want to get on board with it. Um, and then round closing September 18th. So that's an urgency um, ad. So it gives a date. This is when it's going to be done. And you don't want to miss out. Absolutely. And I think Tyler and Matt over at Caddy, the founders over there, again, told you how impactful they were for uh, their advertising creative, um, you know, talked about closing dates. Jeremy uh, at Rad Intelligence, big Jeremy Barnett fans over here. He, he did videos actually on the beach, thanking investors, talking about the traction, uh, emphasizing that September 8th was the last date, the last time to get involved. Uh, you know, their future rounds, all of that have been priced at higher levels. So uh, really wanted to make that a point. And it showed up the last few days, the last week uh, were monumental uh, for, for Rad Intelligence. Uh, this is beyond just words. This will show up in your overall raise amounts. Okay. Sarah, you want to summarize for us? Absolutely. So in summary, one, write with your investor in mind, your sphere of influence, your Jill Scott. Two, make it short, snappy, and eye-catching. Less is more. Uh, three, have a clear and direct CTA. So learn more, invest now, hurry. This offer is only a limited time offer. Uh, focus on benefits, not features lean on numbers and third par uh, party validation. So data, market research, um, any sort of statistics that will uh, be beneficial. 
Uh, six, make it emotional. So that again is with those words that you choose to use and making it urgent. So timeline ads, uh, instilling the emotion of fear of missing out. Uh, and then that is great summary right there. Anything to add? Nothing specific. Uh, have a few stories, have a few overarching ideas. Want to put the bottom line out here that the words you write matter. Uh, strategic copy equals more investments. So, you know, if you're hearing all this and say, we, we don't care, we just want investments. <laughs> We're talking about the same thing. These are steps you could take. And I ensure you, it will set you up for improvements uh, on your investments. And, you know, can't really talk about it enough in terms of A-B testing. If you're running one set of advertising creative, and you're hoping to crack the code with that, you have no comparable. You have no numbers to be able to determine, hey, this is good or this is bad. So put together two to six different advertisements, two to six different lines of, uh, of, of copy to compare against one another. And you'll see what your audience, you'll see what our Jill Scott, our target audience is responding to uh, to the greatest degree. Uh, furthermore, don't feel like you need to hide everything. Talk to your portal about the, the, the creative, about the messaging. Work with an agency, work with a consultant. It doesn't have to be us, but engage experts who are doing these campaigns on a daily basis. Again, we're running the 30 to 50 uh, at a time. Picture all the advertising creatives we have live today, all the ads that we're spending on right now. We could speak in generalities about what's performing best, can't uh, go past confidentiality uh, clauses, of course, but can tell you where we're seeing traction. You can save yourself steps uh, by bringing in these types of voices. And again, not to promote us, consultants, advisors, whatever it may be, uh, you can skip a lot of steps and not to underestimate that competitor audit. Our whole philosophy towards marketing, we summarize, we've already said it a few times in three words, test, optimize, scale, test, optimize, scale. If we're seeing an issuer repeat a set of advertising messaging, it's telling us it's working. They're scaling it. They didn't optimize it out. They're continuing to buy this on a daily basis, likely as much of it as they can to the target audiences that are performing. So maybe there's something there that you can incorporate to your campaign, some type of winning formula that you can add on. Uh, I've seen advertising messaging take months, years to create when working with you know, Fortune 500 type companies, top 100 advertisers in years past. I'll often see advertising copy as a last thought when launching a campaign in the equity crowdfunding vertical. And it does not need to be that way. Draft out some variants for your target audiences, run it by some third parties, shape it a bit based on what you're seeing from competitors and uh, come out of the gate with something that is the foundation for success. Something that is designed to hit a good cost per acquisition of each investor, a good return on ad spend and can scale from there. <clears throat> so wanna open up the floor for any questions. If any listeners have any questions that they want to ask about any slide in the deck, anything about advertising, messaging as a whole, uh, anything for Sarah, anything for, uh, for me, um, we're happy to contribute here, happy to come up with any ideas or anything like that. Um, I'm seeing something here about timeline. Um, Sarah, what is the timeline for putting together advertising copy? What are we seeing in house? Uh, what is that a result of? What type of uh, time period should anyone listening in, in, in uh, you know, account for, for their internal planning? For internal planning, I would definitely give at least two weeks to set it up. You really want to make sure that you have your copy is good to go. You want to have some prospecting ads, some retargeting ads. Um, and with those ads, I'm sorry, my headphone just died. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the headphones up. Oh, uh, I should be back now. 
Okay. Yeah, we can hear you, Sarah. Okay. So what was I saying? Could you quickly remind me? <laughs> Absolutely. Head to malfunctions, common webinar oh, yeah. uh, aspect here. They need to make those AirPod batteries longer. Just talking about timelines right. for putting okay. together advertising copy and, and iterations, uh, revisions of that. Awesome. So typically it takes about two weeks to get all of the the setup ready to go. But from there, once there is um, ad copy and there is a creative to go with that, whether that's a graphic, a video, um, a selfie video from an investor, uh, from a founder, usually revisions will take within a day or two and then um, they'll be ready to go. So revisions don't take super long. Um, I do spend a decent amount of time uh, writing it initially to try to eliminate the need for any revisions. But there are some occasionally, and typically it is just adding in, you know, some, some company branding or a tagline or, or something along those lines. Excellent, excellent. I'm hearing, I'm seeing one here about research. Um, where can you find competitors' ads? Um, I'll, I'll pop on that. So there is a library of advertising uh, creative um, that you can find. You can actually Google it. Um, could put the URL in the comments here too. But if you Google Facebook advertising creative library, uh, you'll see uh, a link come up and you could type in any brand there and be able to see what they're running from a paid uh, sense. We also use tools during the strategy stage, uh, including SEM Rush. Uh, we don't get advertising creative from Statista, but we use it. Um, uh, there, there's a similar web. There's a few other ones that you could get an idea of what competitors are using, uh, what type of search ads they're running, a great way to see their messaging uh, as well. And uh, definitely recommend uh, doing that. It looks like Sarah just posted that to the audience here. Um, and then uh, I see John uh, Adamson here, tombstone statements and regs if advertising data can be tricky. Do you encounter legal issues that make it hard to make killer copy? Yes. Uh, so a lot of the advertisements we do are using um, formats that have been approved by legal. Uh, we do recommend uh, getting approvals by legal as we are not legal experts. Marketing, yes. Uh, legal, whole other component too. Um, the SEC does show two avenues for creating advertising creative for these campaigns. What can be mentioned in one route, what can be mentioned in uh, the tombstone route, definitely uh, encourage you to submit creative to the portal uh, or your legal counsel, whichever makes more sense for your team uh, format. Uh, but yes, it does make it difficult. We'll see it gets sent back uh, from clients at times. Uh, the urgency message, if the campaign gets extended, is a, is a grayer area. So you want to make sure you're um, setting everything up accordingly. Uh, seeing another question here. What will be done by your agency and what has to be done by the company uh, running the race? Uh, so it, it's a good question. We work with groups that are all stages of the spectrum. Some say, hey, here's our advertising creative to spec run this exactly uh, as is. Others say, we have nothing. There's some assets on our page, but we don't know what they are. You, you put together ads for us. Uh, it's an exaggeration on the second one, but you get the idea. And, uh, um, you know, Sarah, maybe you could hop in a bit, but basically we, we do what's needed. So if that's coming up with the whole ideation on the strategy, um, we're certainly contracted to set up with ver uh, set up variants of ad creative and submit to the, to the client for approval, make additional edits until they're a point that actively represents the offering the company in a way that's favored by the team and getting approval. We set everything up there. We launch it there. Sarah, anything to add about what we do versus the, the issuer? Uh, yeah, so we we will, you know, create the ad copy. Uh, we'll do the prospecting ads, the retargeting ads. We'll use our tried and true themes. Um, and you know, of course, if there's a revision, if you need to like scrap the whole ad, you're like, this is not it. We will absolutely redo it. Absolutely. Um, but yeah. We there you go. It. From uh, the the copy creative experts directly. 
uh, who are running a high volume in these campaigns. Those are the recommendations. Uh, if we did not get to your question, feel free to reach out to us directly. We are at the top of the hour. So going to complete the webinar. Sarah, if anyone's listening in here and would like to get in contact with you, uh, continue the conversation further for recommendations or any discussion, what is your preferred channel? So I am on, I'm, I'm on Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn. I have my email. My email is S Bradbury, B-R-A-D-B-U-R-Y at digital niche So you can reach me there and hopefully we'll have some, some fun things to talk about. Excellent. And do not be bashful, reach out. We thoroughly enjoy talking about creative, about copy, about marketing and equity crowdfunding and uh, have a lot of insights to share what's worked, what hasn't worked. So do not hold back. Feel free to get uh, a hold of us on our site. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, let, let's connect. It's a, it's a community here. Rising tides are lifting all ships in the equity crowdfunding space. And uh, we'd be happy to uh, contribute ideas and be a resource to you in any way possible. So I uh, want to thank everyone for tuning in. Sarah, thank you for dropping knowledge on us and uh, we'll see everyone next month for our next webinar.